hope I remember how to do this. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout new season for uh, Wednesday, September 11th, 2019. Uh, I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to catch up like crazy, so don't be surprised if it goes a little long. We've got to talk about Starhopper, SpaceX. We're going to be talking about the loss of India's moon lander. Uh, we've learned a whole bunch about the capabilities of U.S. reconnaissance uh, satellites. Uh, Mercury's magnetic field changing. Hypervelocity star kicked out of the Milky Way. A volcanic exomoon. Uh, oceanic exoplanets and water vapor found around a exoplanet in the habitable zone for the first time. So now we've got a bunch of special co-hosts uh, this week. We're going to introduce everybody, but we also have a really special guest. So this is going to be an action-packed uh, episode of the Weekly Space Hangout, and that's why it might run a little long, a little long. So we're going to go straight into the interview portion uh, before we get on to the in introducing everybody and getting on with the story. So joining us this week, back again for at least the third time, I think, uh, Dr. Alan Stern, Principal Investigator of New Horizons and about 800 other missions. Alan, welcome back to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks, Frazier. It's awesome to be back. Man, uh, so... I mean, we've got so many things, you know, I, I don't think we need to introduce you too much. We've introduced you many times in, in the past. You, uh, of course, you know, principal investigator of New Horizons. How is New Horizons doing? Man, it's doing fantastically. The spacecraft is now uh, just past uh, uh, eight months since our most recent flyby. Still sending the data back from that flyby. At the end of August, we... Uh, we completed a big milestone in terms of the data downlink, which is what's called all the group one data, all the data that's um, the highest priority stuff. Now it's all back on the earth. And then uh, just last week, we finished a big campaign using the spacecraft to calibrate all the scientific instruments so we can make the most out of that data. But also we were looking at other Kuiper belt objects that were passing in the distance and trying to make comparisons with MU-69. So all that data is now stored on the flash drives up on the spacecraft and waiting to start coming down. It all worked perfectly. And, I mean, the bit rate is so slow um, because the spacecraft is so far. Um, you know, when do you anticipate gathering, having all that data here in your hands safely on Earth? It is slow. <laughs> it's a thousand bits per second. Uh, but, you know... On board the spacecraft, we have a 30-watt transmitter, and it's 4 billion miles away. Not 30 kilowatts like an AM station, 30 watts. And uh, it'll take us until um, late next year to get all the data from the flyby and from the kind of observations we're making now. But we're also always making more observations, literally 24-7 on the spacecraft. We're observing the Kuiper Belt environment. Every few months, we observe new Kuiper Belt objects, so we're always adding more data to the queue to come back to the Earth. The whole mission really was, you know, a decade about getting to the Kuiper Belt, and now that we're there, we're making observations every day. And we, of course, had a big flurry of news when you did the the most recent flyby. Uh, have there been any either new pieces of data that have come in or... Um, or maybe some new papers that have been produced based on it that maybe people haven't heard of? Well, we published our first paper. We got on the cover of Science Magazine in May, on the May 16th issue. And then uh, we now have three new papers on the origin of, of this object, MU69, on its composition and on its geology. And they're going to be in a new special issue of Science that will come out at the end of the year. They're in the middle of the scientific refereeing process right now. Uh, so, I mean, you've had a chance now to see three Kuiper Belt objects up close by my, by my count with, you know, Pluto and Charon and then um, uh, MU69. What, you know, are you finding any common elements now between the three? Well, you know, uh, really it's a lot more than that because of course the pluto Charon binary planet is orbited by four small moons, uh, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. 
So the Pluto system is a total of six objects. And then MU69 itself is a double. It's a contact binary. And, you know, of course, it's tiny uh, compared to, uh, to Pluto. Uh, it's about the size of a single mountain block on the surface of Pluto. Uh, it's only 30 kilometers long, and Pluto's 2,400 kilometers across. Sharon's half of Pluto in size. Some of Pluto's smaller satellites are like the size of Ultima Thule. But Ultima Thule, MU69, is the first thing we've ever seen ever in space exploration that was so pristine and wild and always kept in the cold. And finding that it's a contact binary and, in fact, that, you know, the two pancake lobes of it are actually aligned together. They're not, like, stuck together randomly but a line, which probably is due to gravitational torques that took place while they were in orbit around each other as the orbits decayed towards the merger, is giving us huge information about the early days of planetesimal formation that led to dwarf planet and planet formation. So we're milking it for all of its worth. <laughs> right, and more data, more data coming. So, of course, the, the question is, will there be another mission extension? Uh, and if so, what is the new target? This comes from, comes from uh, producer Nancy, and I'm sure this is the question you get, you get now. What, what's next? What's next? Well, what's next for the next couple of years is the current extended mission to observe other Kuiper Belt objects, uh, to observe the Kuiper Belt environment, to get all the MU69 data to the ground, get all that data archived to where everyone, yourself included, can use it and to publish the initial scientific findings. So our, our plate's pretty full, but we're planning for a proposal to do the next extended mission. And we really have the fuel and the power on board the spacecraft to do four or five more extended missions. Whether we get to do that or not depends upon the quality of our proposals, and what NASA decides about funding priorities. So every few years, we'll put in a new proposal, and they'll judge us against all the other missions that also want to get extensions. Um, we're going to look for more flyby targets. Uh, that's still in our future. It took us four years, and it ultimately took the Hubble Space Telescope to find this one. So it's not going to be an overnight process, but we're going to start that next year. And... Uh, if it's out there, there's not a better team than New Horizons to go and find it and then target it. I mean, there's some amazing tools coming online in the next couple of years. LSST comes online in 2021. That'll be the machine that's going to find many of those Kuiper Belt objects out there. You know, how do you, do you see the bubble of knowledge advancing faster than the speed of New Horizons for us mapping out the <laughs> Kuiper Belt? Um, the, the, the really big advance for us is going to be the advent of these 25 and 30 meter telescopes, a little after LSST. LSST is an amazing machine and I'm on the planetary science working group for it. And it's going to revolutionize our knowledge of the solar system and the galaxy and even the universe beyond, but it's not a very good tool for looking for flyby targets for new horizons. And the reason is it's just too small of a telescope. It gives us that time domain uh, for the first time, but its limiting magnitude is about a factor of 100 mm. uh, uh, too bright for the kinds of Kuiper Belt objects that are at this distance. And so we need those big guns like the Hubble and the Keck and then soon telescopes like, like Gemini and the 30-meter telescope that will come online to be able to peer that far out. Or uh, something like the overwhelmingly large telescope, but built on some kind of LSST fast mount that can really pan the sky really quickly. It's, it's being able to yeah, find that'll be, objects. Right? That'll be a long time coming, though, because, you know, we're only going to be in the Kuiper Belt through the late 20s, and then we'll pass beyond. It. And uh, the possibility of flybys will go away, most likely, after that. So we need tools that are online by the mid-20s to find and target those flybys. Um, but we can also search on board with the telescope right. called LORI that's on board New Horizons. That takes fuel away from our ability to target flybys, but it, we know that it's very sensitive, and because it's closer to those KBOs, it gives you a special advantage um, over telescopes back here on the Earth that are very far away. 
So we're going to use every tool in the toolkit. We're going to look under every rock, see what we can find. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like such a tremendous opportunity to be out there in the Kuiper Belt with a spacecraft that's still got lots of fuel on board, instruments working, a communication back home, and and now it just needs to to find something else to to fly past. It's uh, it's wonderful. So right. let's talk and about all, some of the other. All the while, it's being productive right. and taking data on the Kuiper Belt environment and looking at all these other KDOs in ways that you can't because we're at closer range of the team from angles you can't get from the Earth. It's a common misperception that the only science we do are in these close flybys. And of course, they're the most dramatic and the most exciting. And they're the most punch for a single day. But the science that we do day to day and week to week is also uh, really fundamentally important. And we're the only spacecraft in the Kuiper Belt and the only one planned for the time being until somebody else sends another. Right, which we may have time to chat about uh, as we get to the end of this uh, this interview. So what else are you working on? I mean, this is one spacecraft, and it's the one that everyone knows you for. I remember the some of the, the older missions. You're always working on missions. What's next? Well, I'm working on uh, uh, two very high-profile new missions that are approved and now in construction. One is I'm a science team member on the Europa Clipper mission, to study Jupiter's um, ocean world moon, Europa, uh, which will launch in the um, early mid-20s. And then, launching even earlier in 2021, is the Lucy mission. It's the first one to study these primordial objects called Jovian Trojan asteroids. And, and I'm on that science team as well. So I'm excited about both those missions that uh, are going to be getting to their targets in the 30s. And uh, in the case of Lucy, you going to half a dozen of them in the case of Europa or uh, excuse me, Europa Clipper, doing orbits of Jupiter and making dozens of flybys to explore Europa with this spectacular payload. Just this summer, I led a proposal with a whole team of planetary scientists in a competition that NASA's conducting for the next two discovery missions that will launch in the late 20s. Our mission is called Centaurus, and it features uh, the first exploration of these objects called centaurs that are Kuiper Belt objects that have escaped the Kuiper Belt and now come closer. They orbit among the giant planets. So I like to call Centaurus a shortcut to the Kuiper Belt. And, uh, you know, if it turns out that we do well in the competition, there are almost 20 missions competing for just two slots. But if we do well, next year NASA uh, will uh, fund five of those missions to really study in depth how they'll be designed and uh, how the whole flight will be conducted. And I'm hopeful, uh, you know, I think we wrote a pretty good proposal. I'm sure all of our competitors did too, but I'm hopeful that we'll get a chance to be in the finals. Well, where, I mean, if you, I mean, it's pretty exciting, of course, that Europa Clipper is is in the works. I know it's, uh, it's potentially going to get a lander. Um, and I know that's a bit of a controversial uh, decision right now because, and in fact, it's funny, you were the person who, who told me back many years ago that there's this there's this process you go through, right? You send a flyby, then you send an orbiter, then you send uh, you know some kind of rover lander, and then you send a sample return. And so step two is let's send the let's send the orbiter, then send the then send the, the lander. Um, but if you had to do both at the same time. You know, do you think there's there's going to be a lot of viable locations to land based on the trajectory that the well, spacecraft's going to take? Well, um, Europa Clipper is not going to involve a lander. I think there's some confusion out there. Um, Europa Clipper is a Jupiter orbiter designed to make dozens of close passes to Europa and to map it. Um, but we will follow that at some point with a Europa lander to actually get down onto the ice and to sample Europa directly. And Europa Clipper will scout landing sites for it. And the two have been coupled together in Congress as a pair of missions. Um, but, uh, but Europa Clipper itself doesn't do a landing. So it, no, but it won't have a lander on board, like a, like a Huygens to Cassini. Right. It won't be like that. Uh, the, the lander will come later, okay. launched on a different rocket in a different year to arrive after Clipper. Um, uh, Dave Dickinson is asking, um, will the Clipper have a, an RTG on board? Um, 
No, we're perfecting the technology now to use solar arrays further out, which is important. Oh, like like um, Juno. Because we want it like Juno, exactly, and yeah. like Rosetta before it, um, in the middle solar system. And that lets us save the plutonium, which is precious, to use yeah, on I, missions like we would like to fly a Neptune orbiter, and we really need yeah. plutonium for that, or a Pluto orbiter. So, in fact, Centaurus, which will go all the way to Saturn if it's funded on, um, on solar power, um, is another one. It avoids the need to use an RTG in plutonium uh, by using these new technology solar arrays that Juno has now demonstrated work so well. I was curious because I know Mars 2020 next year is, it has a plutonium RTG and, and there's only so much around right now. The DOE restarted their production, but uh, it's kind of, you know, like you said, it's in short supply. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we want to preserve the plutonium to use it where we really need it. The rovers need it because they want to be able to drive at night and be productive yeah. all the time, 52 weeks a year. Um, and on solar rays, it's just not possible on Mars, particularly if you're not on the equator where the sun is the strongest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Alan, uh, I want to sort of let you go. Uh, I know you've got, you've got a bunch of spacecraft to watch out for, um, but but again, always a pleasure to have you here on the Weekly Space Hangout. We're super excited by uh, all of the adventures that New Horizons is is having, and uh, I know that when Europa Clipper and Lucy actually just did uh, an episode all about the Lagrange points and, and dug into what the Lucy mission is, and it sort of makes a ton of sense to catch a bunch of asteroids all the at the Lagrange points like you know six asteroids for one mission so it's great um I, I can't wait to uh to hear how where this all goes next so thank you so much for joining us here on the weekly space hangout today thanks for you thanks all you guys it was a pleasure all right we'll see you next Take time care. bye now bye all right, and so now uh, let's get into the actual introduction of all of my co-hosts. So on screen today, uh, right now, I've got uh, Dave Dickinson. Dave. Hey, I've come full circle from, uh, from weekly host to uh, also special guest, and now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, and of course, you're working on the next book. Yes, I'm working on a, a complete deep sky guide for all the deep sky objects. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, rather ambitious project here. I've, I've got a manuscript deadline for next month. Should be out in July. Yeah. That's awesome. And the... Oh, that's... I have a, co I have a cover. Oh, that's a great. Very ten I have a very tentative cover. And that, that might not be the cover we go with, but I would be okay with it. And I'm going to write the introduction, right? That's the plan? Yes. Right on. Yes. Uh, awesome. Uh, and of course, returning for this season, we've got uh, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Oh, can't really be proud. Um, and she'll be back. I'm not sure. Is she here next week? Anyway, we're next, see next week, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. And there'll be some combination of Kimberly and... Morgan and all of the uh, all of the new co-hosts. So let's meet some of your new uh, co-hosts. Uh, first uh, on my screen, I've got uh, Moya McTier. Mor McTier. Here. That's me. Hey. Hi. So happy to be here. Welcome to the week's. So who are you? And what do you do? <laughs> who am I? I ask myself that question every day. Yeah. Um, we won't. We won't guess... ask that every week, though. We're going to get one answer, and then you know we'll be able to move okay. on. And then I can't change as a person for the we'll rest of my We'll just life. remember for you. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, I, I guess most relevant to this podcast is that I'm a fourth year PhD student in the astronomy program at Columbia. My thesis is trying to figure out uh, if there's any sort of relationship between the structure and motion of the Milky Way and populations of exoplanets. And? Well, I'm, I'm only- That's on what you're figuring year. out. <laughs> I'm figuring, it looks like, like there, there should be some, you know, uh, stars look different in different parts of the Milky Way. And we know that the characteristics of a planet really heavily depend on the characteristics of its star. So if stars look different, then planets should be different. And uh, that, I'm just trying to prove that. And I mean, we always hear, right, that, that the milk, or sorry, the, you know, the sun is just the right distance. It's in the habitable zone of the Milky Way that if we were too close, it would be sort of a nasty place, and if and if we were too far out, then we wouldn't have a lot of those heavier elements that we 
require we're an exoplanet to somebody else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is this sort of validating this idea of this galactic habitable zone, places we should be looking for planets and places where we probably just don't need to bother? Yeah, pretty much. I like to say that we're in a pretty boring neighborhood uh, in the galaxy. And I lately have been focusing on the galactic bulge, the, the center of the galaxy where things are a lot more chaotic, not in the literal sense, but things are moving faster. There are more stars, so there's more radiation. And uh, I'm really interested in how often stars in the galactic bulge will actually encounter each other. Uh, how often do they pass close by each other, close enough that they can strip away each other's planets or destabilize the planet's orbits. So I'm trying to figure that out now. And and occasionally stars getting kicked right out of the Milky Way. And that leads us to our other uh, special uh, co-host this week. Uh, we've got uh, Michael Roderick. Michael, welcome to the Yes, hi, thank you. you for having me here today. And who are you? What do you do? Uh, so I am also a graduate student. I am at Penn State. I'm in my seventh year, hoping to graduate this year. And my research is more on extragalactic studies. So I look at merging galaxies. And as these galaxies merge, you get these uh, streams of material that gets kind of pulled out from them called tidal tails. And so I'm looking at the stellar populations that are inside those tidal tails, star clusters, or just stars that are kind of strewn about the entire tail. That's awesome. Um, and I mean, like most recently, we learned that the Milky Way is a little bit warped. And is that from sort of a similar collision fairly recently? So the Milky Way is going through a lot of minor mergers. And so it's got a lot of small dwarf satellites that are orbiting around it, and it's kind of stripping those out. Whether or not it's enough to warp the disk, I'm not entirely sure. There hasn't been a major merger for some time. So it's mostly the minor mergers, these small little satellite galaxies that it's uh, slowly cannibalizing and eating up. I mean, I love uh, Gaia is like one of my favorite missions and how Gaia is like mapping out all of these streams of stars from other galaxies that have just been dismantled and added to the mass of the Milky Way. And you just see these, you know, these long tidal streams of stars, but they're, they're just part of the Milky Way now. So right. That. That's actually what really got me into astronomy, not Gaia, but um, SESS, the Sloan Digital Sky yeah. Survey, uh, just finished its photometry years ago. But you could see these streams of stars that are actually getting pulled out from the Milky Way. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. And so I'm kind of looking at that on a bigger scale with the entire galaxies instead of just small these uh, satellite galaxies. Right on. All right. So let's, uh, I mean, everybody's got some news. I believe I've interviewed. Should we, should we kind of jump to the kind of, should we words? It's been a long few months. No, I, <laughs> should we maybe sort of talk a little about how things are going to work this year? Let's do it. It's going to be a little different than we did before. You know, at the end of, of last year, uh, Kimberly and Paul and I and Fraser and Pamela kind of got together and, and looked to see what was working and, and what wasn't working so well. And we kind of came to the conclusion that it would be better if we had more different voices on the show. Uh, Paul's getting really busy. Kimberly and I have been getting busier. And we remembered what it was like to be on the show when we were in graduate school, the value that it added to our, our education and our, our career paths to take us where we are. And we wanted to offer that as an opportunity for other people. And so we called up a bunch of old friends, people like Dave, who have been on the show sometimes longer than, than we have. And then we put out the call for uh, a whole crop of, of new people. And I've been uh, calling and interviewing people for, for weeks now, and we pulled out the very best uh, upcoming astronomy communicators that we can find, and we're gonna throw them into, uh, into the deep end and, and see, what, uh, see who swims and, and who doesn't. Uh, and so you'll see less of me and less of Kimberly and less of Paul. Uh, Fraser will be our rock, uh, but uh, we'll have more people, more news, and, and more good things coming this year than we've had in, in a long time. I'm really excited. Yeah, and if you know of science communicators, people who are sort of starting on their journey that you know, want practice, um, communicating with the public uh, in a fairly live setting, want to get into podcasting, YouTube, things like that, uh, pass our name along, and uh, we'll try to bring them on as, as uh, guest 
co-hosts. So this is an experiment and a huge, huge uh, thank you to uh, Susie and Nancy, of course, for uh, shepherding this whole process. Yeah, and sort of handling all of the introductions and the interviews and kind of coordinating all of this. Morgan and I get to just show up and do our part, but they've been uh, working really hard behind the scenes to, to get this all organized. So I hope that this all works. And if it does, it's all thanks to them not us. Uh, so uh, Morgan, I'm going to let you go first just to, to let the, uh, let people see how it's done. And then, uh, and then I will start uh, selectively uh, choosing people to, to, uh, to grill. What do you got for well, us? Well, Fraser, you know that I have a rule and, and that's that I no longer will talk about things that Elon Musk tweets because, you know, then I'd never go to bed. I'd never go eat breakfast. You just talk all day long about the stuff that, that Elon is tweeting. And so it's been a while since I've talked uh, in real life or virtually about what's been going on in, in commercial space. But SpaceX has been up to quite a lot since we last talked. And I thought it would be worth kind of ticking through where things are and, and where it looks like things might be going. And so the big thing that has happened in uh, the summer were the tests of this prototype for Starship called Starhopper. This is kind of the affectionately known water cooler with wings. And they built this sort of giant uh, tank in the desert and they strapped some of their new experimental uh, Raptor engines to it and started just blasting them off. First testing it on the stand, then hovering it up a little bit more. And then a couple of weeks ago, they finally sort of flew the thing for real. And they, threw, they put three of these Raptor engines onto uh, the ship and they hovered it up to about 150 meters, which is the highest point that the FAA will allow you to fly without doing a whole bunch of extra uh, paperwork. And they showed that it worked. The engines were individually controllable. They were throttleable up. They were throttleable down. They, they did all the stuff that they were supposed to do. And, and that means that we're on track to sort of move forward with uh, progression towards bigger and bigger ships. And while Starhopper has been doing these tests, SpaceX has been testing or has been building some prototypes of the big full-sized Starship spacecraft. They've got one being built here in Texas, one being built in Florida, and they're basically pitting these teams against one another to see who can get it built first and who can get it built in a way that works. And now that we know the engines work, it's time to start looking ahead and putting more and more of these things together and checking out the aerodynamics and the flight capabilities of the larger spacecraft. And so just as soon as next month, we might see the first suborbital tests of the Starship uh, spacecraft where they'll take it up uh, instead of a, you know, a few hundred meters, they'll take it up a few kilometers and then higher and higher and they'll practice bringing it back down. All of these steps that they'll need to do to finally maybe next year or the year after put Starship into orbit <laughs> and, and test this thing out for the first time. And this all seems sort of, you know, impossibly rapid, except we've seen these steps happen before. Right. We saw the jump from Grasshopper to uh, Falcon 9. We saw Falcon 9 iterate many times. We saw Falcon 9 turn into Falcon Heavy. And in all of this, suggests that it's not crazy to think that in the next year, we'll see a brand new giant satellite orbiting Earth and then coming back down uh, under its own control. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the big... That's just amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Like, th th this idea that a rocket can land under, under its own power now is kind of has been done. It's like cable stakes. Yeah. And so you saw the, you saw, as you said, you saw the original, uh, was it, was it the dragonfly? What was the original one called? Grasshopper, right? Grasshopper. Yeah. Grasshopper, yeah. And then you've got the Falcon 9 doing that landing. And so to see the, the water tower take off and then land and the amazing gimbal on that rocket engine was wonderful. Um, uh, I should pull up the, the video while we're, while we're talking. Anyway, um, that is, 
it's that rocket actually that the Raptor engine that is one of the greatest accomplishments of SpaceX. This full right. Ra Raptor is key, yeah, because you know the whole point of Starship is to use it not one time or two times or ten times, but a hundred times. And the key element to using it a hundred times is being able to create giant explosions inside of the rocket a hundred times. And that required totally re-engineering the uh, idea of how they were going to make the rocket work. They're using a totally different fuel mixture than they were using before. Everything is in service of this reusability. And so to see the thing fly uh, is proof that they've taken a huge leap towards uh, being able to, to use this engine in in space and and that's not even it just like yesterday they announced that next year they're planning 24 launches of the falcon 9 to start floating the sky uh, the star link or star links, satellites. yeah uh, and each one you know, carrying never, 60 satellites right next basically month, yeah, nobody's ever launched 24 times in a year and this is just for this one program on top of everything else yeah and uh, spacex has to be careful that they're not sort of growing faster than they can manage because we saw about a month ago uh, a pretty grumpy ESA when Starlink yeah. uh, sort of buzzed one of ESA's earth monitoring satellites and you know if that's a problem with 60 satellites uh, how's it going to be when they have hundreds and thousands of satellites up there 12, the technology 000. is cl clearly there but what are they working on operationally to keep everything you yeah. know functioning smoothly there are already defunct satellites from the first starlink launch yeah yeah, yeah. And what there, are we going to do there. about that you know yeah. blasting off 60 satellites and seeing 56 work is incredible but that uh you know a 90 percent rate is not good enough when you're talking about launching 10,000, <laughs> because you know then you have a thousand satellites up there uh not not doing the right the right thing and, and that's just unacceptable and I, so i think i'm more optimistic than i've been in a long time that spacex is moving in the direction of making a lot of this stuff work but the detail the implementation underneath that technological advancement is just as important to the long-term stability of of what they're trying to do and now you had some other errata some other spacex errata I think that was the, those three are the sort of big three that I saw. I mean, they've continued to sell uh, flights. They've been talking a lot about possible landings on the moon and certainly helping NASA with uh, some of these smaller missions that they're looking to, to send. Uh, alongside this Starlink announcement, they mentioned that for the first time in, in their history, they're now sort of getting ready faster than the missions are. <laughs> Uh, you know, people have been noticing that there's actually been fewer missions this year than there were last year. And that's sort of incongruent with these big proposals of, oh, we're going to be growing, growing, growing every year. But it turns out they have plenty of rockets lined up to fly. The payloads for many of those rockets have been experiencing delays. Right. And, and that's impressive from uh, SpaceX's perspective, but it also suggests that, you know, this isn't Amazon, right? There's not uh, infinite growth to happen in the, the launch market for, for satellites. And so they're gonna have to figure out how to sustain their business with the ups and downs of a market that really only has a few customers in it. Uh, in addition, a couple of things you, you didn't mention, uh, Elon Musk uh, offhandedly mentioned that the next plan is to double the size of the Starship uh, to make an 18 we don't, meter. We don't talk about Twitter comments. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> I do. You don't, but I do. Um, I, I hand off stories to writers based on uh, offhanded Twitter comments. David. I think they're still aiming to do the first crew Dragon uh, launch by the end of the year. So, yeah, that's probably more likely to slip into early next year, but yeah. they have more or less resolved their accident investigation from the pad abort test that's and true. are comfortable they know and have adjusted the design for the flaws that that, that indicated. And, and, we were talking when that happened that that was potentially a huge setback that could have yeah. been years of redesign. Yeah. And it seems like they sort of have fared as, as well as possible under the circumstances and that, you know, they're not going back and fundamentally changing how uh, Crew Dragon works. They were able to make these small adjustments and, and get the schedule uh, back on track. And, and, and Boeing is moving forward in, in much the same way. 
Excellent. Uh, I look forward to the next batch of SpaceX news. We got to make sure it's not all SpaceX all the time. Moyo, let's talk about uh, volcanic exomoons. Yeah, uh, I will probably never pitch a story about SpaceX. <laughs> okay. no, you don't have to worry about that from me. Perfect. Uh, I, yeah, I, I saw this story that a team coming out of Switzerland thought that they had the first indirect evidence for an exomoon and a volcanically active exomoon at that. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so this team, they weren't originally looking for exomoons. They were trying to study the atmosphere of WASP-49b, a planet about 550 light years away from us. And they detected high amounts of sodium gas in the upper, upper levels of this planet. In fact, the, these signals were coming from so far off the planet's surface, about one and a half times the radius of the planet, that it seemed like they couldn't possibly be coming from the planet alone. Uh, and so they ran some models, ran some tests, and it seemed like the best explanation for these high amounts of sodium gas coming from really high off the planet were an exomoon orbiting this planet that's very volcanically active. Uh, something kind of reminiscent of Io in our own solar system, one of the, the most volcanically active worlds in the solar system, one of the moons of Jupiter. Um, since then, it's had some uh, mixed reviews, um, some mixed uh, reactions. So I, I thought that this story was really cool because my advisor is David Kipping, yes. who has made in his if entire someone career- Someone who loves exomoons, it's David Kipping. Exactly, yeah. He's made it his, his entire career out of failing to find an exomoon. Uh, and so I, I asked one of the people in my research group who also works on exomoons uh, what he thought about it, and he, he, wasn't, he wasn't that into it. <laughs> um, he, he looked at their results and he said that everything in their findings was entirely too convenient. Right. Um, there, there's really only a very narrow set of conditions uh, that are stable for an exomoon around a planet. It has to be close enough to its planet that it's you know, caught by its gravity, but not too close that it's uh, within the Roche limit and getting ripped apart by the planet's gravity. And uh, apparently the, the location of this moon that was proposed by the Switzerland team is just, just right uh, for the moon to be stable. So what's uh, the alternative? Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. It's not a moon. That's a great question. Um, I don't know, something maybe uh, sending off jets. Uh, we have moons in our solar system that are sending off these huge jets that uh, could, if they're powerful enough, I guess, have these uh, signatures high up. And that would be even cooler surface. than a moon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but then I guess the, the question though is like, if, like why, why would they think that it's it's a moon? Why is this is the evidence of this sulfur? I mean, we're at the point now where astronomers are starting to make observations of the atmospheres of of other planets, and we'll we'll probably talk about a pretty exciting one later on in this show. Why wouldn't you find sulfur in the atmosphere of of a planet? Uh, so it's it's sodium, and so you you oh, can find so sodium. Yeah, sodium. Yeah. Yeah, you can find it in the atmosphere of a planet. I think the, the thing that tipped them off that it wasn't just the planet itself was that the signal was so far from the center of the planet. Right. Uh, so maybe this planet is puffier than we thought it was before. And so if its atmosphere is much bigger than we expect, then it's definitely possible for signals to be coming very high off the planet's surface. Um, but we, we just don't have enough data to know more about the planet itself. And it's a it's a nice, catchy title. It's a yeah. nice headline to say we have indirect evidence for the first exomoon, um, but definitely more work needs to be done to say that with confidence. And I guess the the goal would be to somehow uh, confirm it using some other methodology. And I mean, is there any other methodology at disposal as exoplanetary researchers to be able to confirm that yes indeed i mean it's like mm -hmm. the radio velocity method the transit method wait for a for a um yeah. you know a micro lensing event huh. uh i mean any of those could work if the moon is big enough and in a convenient orientation uh with respect to both us and its host planet uh the the people in my research group alex Tichi and david kipping they look for moons based on transits. 
the idea that these very small variations in a light curve can tip you off that there is a moon there, but the moon has to be very large uh, to show up in a light curve or you need just very, very sensitive data. Um, and so they can do follow-up observations to see if they can detect it through other means like uh, the transit method or radio velocity of the, of the planet, maybe transit timing variations or transit duration variations, uh, meaning that this moon is, is pulling on its planet enough that it's throwing off the timing for uh, the planet transiting in front of its star. So right now we are still not confirmed for an exomoon discovery. Right. I mean, I know I'm biased yeah. because I want to believe that my advisor and my colleague found the first exomoon. Uh, they they had a story last year about Kepler 1625b and a potential moon around that found using the transit method. And I think it'd be really great if they were right. And I also saw them doing the work. I saw how careful they were and how careful they were in responding to feedback from the community uh, in a way that I don't necessarily see this team from Switzerland being as careful in their announcement. Fantastic. Uh, all right, Michael, let's talk about a uh, star getting kicked out of the Milky Way. Yeah. And so it's not a... the usual culprit that we would think of. Right. So in the past, uh, we have theorized that you can eject stars from a galaxy if it passes close to the center of the galaxy and it gets kind of a kick from a supermassive black hole of that galaxy. So the idea is that if you have a binary star system, one of those pairs of stars can get kind of plucked off by the supermassive black hole and the other star gets uh, thrown out of the galaxy. And we found one of these about maybe six months ago and it had the greatest title I've ever seen of Star Yeeted Out of Galaxy. Uh, this is not quite the same. It actually doesn't quite have the velocity to get kicked out of the galaxy. It's still bound. But the interesting thing is that it's not coming from the center of the galaxy. It's actually coming from the disk of the galaxy, one of the spiral arms. And there are no supermassive black holes there. So then there has to be some other explanation for how the star was kicked out. So the idea is that it could have encountered a intermediate mass black hole, some other massive star, like 30 times the mass of the sun, or maybe some combination of encounters with different stars, and that caused it to get thrown out of the galaxy. But what's also interesting is that where it came from, we don't know of a star cluster from that region. And this is a pretty young star. They found it's a, a B star. These things don't last very long, you know, tens of millions of years before they die and blow up. So it probably came from some star cluster that we don't know about and is somehow flying through the galaxy at enormous speeds. Hmm. Uh, and now I've sort of heard the thinking that maybe this is evidence of some kind of mid mass an intermediate mass black hole did the kick. Right. So it's hard to say definitively what the object was like you can kind of make a guess at the mass of the object and so intermediate blasts black holes fall into that range like we found with LIGO um, and you know anytime you mention intermediate blast mass black hole you're going to latch onto that it could just be a massive star as well but the black hole is probably one of the more intriguing and interesting possibilities for this ejection. Well, you think about these mechanisms that can actually do this, right? You've got the situation where you've got two stars in some kind of binary pair. One detonates as a supernova, it's gone, and now the new star has got this big kick. And the other mm -hmm. possibility is this like a three-body interaction with some big black hole, or maybe one star goes into the black hole and the other star is now, you know, relieved of its uh, partner and is, uh, can then tour the galaxy uh, is yeah is which of those do you kind of prefer uh probably not the supernova one i think we would probably have seen some kind of x-ray emission maybe from that area from a supernova remnant uh it seems plausible that this thing just kind of got flung around by some other objects uh, i mean star clusters can be pretty dense it's very common for stars to interact with each other as they're forming it's not uncommon for them to get ejected, maybe not at this high velocity, but they certainly will interact with each other. So that would, I think, definitely be my preference. Uh, and it's also interesting to me that it's actually not leaving the, the black hole. It's not leaving the galaxy, so it's still bound and it's going to continue orbiting the galaxy for, for a long time. Do we see a lot of these, like stars on really weird orbits 
like this? No, there's really only a handful of these. Uh, they call them hypervelocity stars with uh, speeds of around hundreds of kilometers a second. Uh, there's not many known, only I think less than 10 right now that we know of. So these are these are pretty rare, and it's kind of exciting to find one of these. So I guess the next step then is to try and trace back the source and find out better with like who done it. Yeah, yeah, try to find that star cluster. Uh, Dave Dickinson, uh, tell us about the uh, the sad story of India's lander. Yeah, well, it's only partially sad because the orbiter is still functioning. But uh, that's why I said has, the lander. Yeah, it it hasn't been a, a good year to try to land on the moon. Well. Um, China did manage to land on the moon earlier this year in January. Then uh, we had the tragedy of Space IL earlier this year with the, the first Israeli, the private company that tried to land, and that was not to be. And then last Friday, uh, Chandrayaan-2, uh, India's uh, ISRO's uh, ambitious mission, actually it's uh, orbiter, lander, and rover. So had it had worked, it would have been kind of interesting, but it's... Uh, it was also going to land at the poles at 70 degrees south latitude, which is the furthest south anything has ever landed uh, near the poles. Uh, this is the second China, or Indian mission. Uh, Chandrayaan-1 actually found evidence of uh, polar ice at the shadow craters on the moon. So they wanted to send a lander and rover to investigate. This was solar powered. It was only going to last for two weeks. So we're watching the landing last Friday. And, you know, everything was going pretty well. They had the live broadcast. Then there's that five or 10 minutes that started feeling all of a sudden like the, uh, the space IL landing where there was this uncomfortable pause and it went on and on and on. And then uh, we're like, eh, it's, I, I think they, you notice when you watch the trajectory on the screen too, there was some talk about whether the lander was started tumbling, like they were getting some telemetry from it. It definitely it looked uh, a little was wiggly. shallower. It looked a little it felt wiggly. Remarkably and, and, like Space IL. They're yeah. So similar. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, I think they they were clearly Space IL was clearly off track a lot earlier in their trajectory. Like it was starting to accelerate really high up in the orbit. And in and with this one, it seemed to be coming nicely down in its sort of landing window. It, but it then was it, shallow toward that last kilometer. Yeah, or two and when you, you could look see the, the sort of the wiggles in the trajectory so, and then and then the I, numbers were all going in the wrong directions. You know, things I, that should be slowing down really, were speeding up. I'm getting really good at rewriting my articles within about 10 <laughs> minutes now because you have this article all set as yep. a journalist about as uh, hoping for a successful landing. And then yeah. I had to scramble to rewrite it. Uh, the article I put out for Sky and Telescope. We, we had the exact same thing happening on Universe Today where, you know, I tasked the writer. I'm like, oh, do you want to cover this landing? He's like, yeah, no problem. And then, you know rewrite rewrite but, but like i mentioned the orbiter is still uh functioning and successful so and, and there is a rumor out there that they have a photograph of the that they've flown chandrayaan 2 over the site and that there's images of the of the lander on the surface they're still trying to contact it but at this point it would be the miracle comeback story of the year if it actually <laughs> yeah. just started talking about a week later it I would mean, rewrite uh, the uh, the dynamics of spacecraft landing litho breaking as a legitimate way to land on uh, on cause the you, moon because you remember the loss of beagle 2 on mars yep. and then there was a chaparelli they lost i think the only one that ever started talking partially didn't the philae lander start talking a little bit back when it crashed on well uh, they took photos of it for sure so yeah you know they got some pictures of it i mean there's i mean there are some amazing stories of spacecraft recoveries but not a lot of of stuff from landers they they either land safely as expected or they hit hard and i'll, I'll point out nasa the ranger missions if you ever read about them back in the 60s it took nasa four tries ranger four was the first one that even hit the moon yeah uh, the ranger yeah, it took one the crashed. soviets 11 attempts yeah before they were talking about landed venus on the moon so I, yeah. i'd say that yeah. india is in pretty good shape right now and i th i think the, i think the soviets are like 13 and one for mars landings they've never really successfully landed on yeah. mars they've tried but so it's uh it was an ambitious try for the first time yeah it's a it's a it's a hard space as we keep learning is difficult and and so, although, you know, my heart goes out to the, all of the engineers who worked on this and, and everyone there. And I know I was watching the live stream and there was like 150,000 people and they were just, they were so excited. 
uh, tons of people uh, were speaking in, in languages that I didn't understand. Um, and then you could just see the just the tide turning and there was just this disappointment and hope, but disappointment. disappointment. And, yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. There, there was a flood of, of warm sentiments on Twitter, which I really appreciated. People saying, oh, this is too bad, but, you know, I'm, I'm still so proud uh, to to you know, call this my country or to- There was that great video of the of Narendra Modi uh, hugging the PI of the mission who was just sobbing. Oh. And the, the support was just, yeah. was outstanding. It's, it's challenging as a journalist when when the, the Chinese space program, the Korean space program, the Indian space program to get information out, unlike with the ESA and NASA missions, I actually rely mostly on other Indian science journalists that follow these things is where I'm getting my information from because- it's, uh, well, it's a little more difficult to get contacts with the, the, the principal investigators and things. ISRO was pretty good this time around, actually. I found it was, you know, they had a lot of information on the website, a lot of good details, a lot of pictures, a lot of contact information. And then they ran their landing as a live stream, which was brave. Yeah, and that was, yeah. yeah, I mean, I wish we could get that kind of information from the Chinese space agencies. Yeah, that's another tough one to crack right there. Yeah. It, it, we rely mostly like on guys like Andrew Jones over in the UK. He's a journalist that, that follows the, the Chinese space program, what they're doing. So. Yeah. So the when the recent Israeli spacecraft uh, crashed on the moon, NASA had snapped a few images of the crash site with the LRO. Is there any plan to try to do this with the Indian I, probe? Is there any kind of like professionalism? Like we don't want to take pictures of your dead spacecraft and like <laughs> oh. them to everyone or like. Well, I expect we'll see LRO yeah. missions photos of this site too. And there was so, talk about there were water bears on that uh, mission that they think may have made it to the surface. There was some discussion about that. Too. On the Israeli one, yeah. Yeah, on the Israeli one. So yeah. we may have actually colonized the moon with water bears. Yeah. The telescope on Chandrayaan 2 is actually uh, higher resolution than the telescope on, on LRO. I think that's okay. probably the sort of what uh, they've, they've led with was they're expecting up to seven years of observations with the orbiter at 32, milli or 32 centimeter resolution. And, and so Chandrayaan is still going to make a, a tremendous uh, advance to what we understand about the moon, just not from the surface, surface. Yeah. Uh, and that's a bummer but to have any part of a mission succeed is still yeah. a tremendous victory and and we're going to learn so much even above and beyond what lro has been teaching us for the last decade it's a great point right like like i think we're all seeing it as a failure and i think you're exactly right morgan it is a, the the fact that this, they got the spacecraft at such a relatively inexpensive budget it made you know all the way out to the moon, orbited the moon, deployed the lander. Landers are disposable anyway, and the rover was only going to last for a single day. Two weeks. Yeah, yeah. one single Five weeks. countries have tried to land on the moon. Three of them have only tried for the first time in the last five years. And so we are, you know, at the leading edge of yeah. a tidal wave of yeah. exploration. Yeah. And, and you're going to crash now and then on, on the leading edge, but so much more exploration of the moon, you know, in the last decade than in the decades before that. Yeah. We passed, and that's uh, just such a great sign. We yeah. passed the 50 year anniversary of Apollo 11. So interest in the moon was higher. It was expected this year that it was going to be renewed interest in the moon. All right. Uh, well, so I'm going to quickly chime in because this is sort of a big story that broke today. Uh, and I know we we sort of everyone was was scrambling on this. We actually actually wrote a, a video for this. So we're probably going to release this in the next uh, couple of days. Um, which is that uh, astronomers for the first time have discovered water vapor in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. And this is actually a planet that astronomers have known about for quite a while. It's called uh, Kepler or K218b. And astronomers actually first discovered it with Kepler back in 2015, I believe. And interesting, you know, they discovered it with the transit method, determined that it was about uh, eight times the size of the Earth. So definitely the super Earth uh, mini Neptune zone. Uh, sorry, tw twice as big as Earth. And then um, astronomers were able to follow up using the radial velocity method to get at the mass of the planet. And that's how they discovered that it's eight times as massive as the Earth. And so that actually showed that the density of the planet is, is a little lower than the density of, of Earth. It's more like, uh, you know, it's more than water, 
but less than rock, which means that it maybe has a fairly big atmosphere, maybe has um, uh, a lot of water on it. It's located in the habitable zone uh, around a red dwarf star orbits every 33 days. So they did follow on observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, and they were able to sort of you know, subtract the the times when the planet was passing in front of the star to determine the atmosphere. And the researchers were able to develop some fairly cool new algorithms to get at uh, what that atmosphere was. And they detected the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. So it doesn't mean that there is necessarily water on the surface of the planet. It could be, you know, just it's in uh, there's vents, you know, back again, there's like some kind of, you know, hydrothermic vents that are spraying material out, or maybe it's just like steam, it's up in the upper clouds, doesn't necessarily mean there's water on the surface. But, but this is the first time that water vapor water has been detected around the habitable, you know, on a planet in the habitable zone of of another uh, star. So it's a pretty exciting uh, new discovery. That said, um, the planet, of course, being eight times more massive, uh, double the size of the Earth, the gravity is about, I calculated the gravity was 1.65, 1.7 times Earth, so you definitely wouldn't want to walk around. Of course, if you're like a space whale, then you're swimming in the water, mm -hmm. and that's no problem. Uh, it's probably tidally locked, of course, to its star, which many of these planets going around red dwarf stars are, or sorry, M dwarfs, as the astronomers call them. Um, um, and so now you know that, uh, you know, one side is going to be baking, the other side is going to be really cold. And then, of course, these stars are really uh, troublesome early on in their lifetimes. They throw out enormous flares that are quite devastating and would strip away the, the atmosphere of, a, of any kind of planet like this and make it a pretty miserable place to live. So not great for life probably but still the first time water has been found around uh, another planet in the habitable zone uh Moya, have uh, you been watching this uh well i i saw it on twitter just about an hour before joining the call um <laughs> and and was really excited about it i didn't get to read the paper i think it's coming out in nature tomorrow um or today something like that but something that I haven't seen people talking about, you know, in the last two hours on Twitter is that uh, I haven't seen anyone call it a rocky planet. And I think that that's really important because it is two times the size of Earth, its total radius. Um, and there was a paper that I, I love from a few years ago by Leslie Rogers saying that most planets more than one and a half times the Earth's radius aren't rocky. Uh, so people will talk about water on the surface of this planet it might not be, be a rocky planet. There might not be a surface. It might just be a, a mini Neptune it made of lots of water. It was 2.66 grams per cubic centimeter mm -hmm. was the number that I had, had seen. So that's, you know, Earth's like 4.5 grams mm -hmm. per cubic centimeter and water is like one per. So it's, so it's definitely more than water. Um, yeah. although, you know, maybe compressed water. I'm not sure what you can get your density oh, of water a core down to. And, and all of that. It's not yeah. just a droplet of water in space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's water under pressure. But uh, <laughs> uh, but that would be fascinating too, right? A blob of water twice the size of the <laughs> Earth, eight times the math, mass of the Earth, um, which is a whole other weird extreme place. Mm. Uh, but then it's, it's kind of sad, right? When will we get a chance to know better? Who's going to tell uh, us? I, I think that, you know, James Webb will help. Anything that can give us a better idea of how puffy the atmosphere is, because then we'd get a sense of what is the ratio of atmosphere to core in this planet. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one uh, is the aerial mission, which is coming up in uh, 2028. That's only job is to analyze the atmospheres of planets that are passing in front of stars. So I think that's another shot at it. And then of course, those monster telescopes that Alan was talking about early on, they will be they able will to be. directly observe these, these yeah. planets as well, so. Either way, I don't think this planet is gonna have a hard time getting follow-up observations. It's gonna make quite a splash. Yeah, it'll be first on the list, splash. See what you did there.
Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, I said that we were going to run long. We're about five minutes long. And so although we had a bunch more stories to cover, I think we're going to have to uh, call it here. Uh, but of course, uh, before we go, I want to give everyone a chance to uh, tell us what they're working on. So uh, Morgan, why don't you go first? Again, we'll show people how it's done and then uh, we'll move on. Yeah, my gallery launch pad is open uh, at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo and, and asking uh, where will we be 50 years from now. So if you're in uh, Texas or Oklahoma or thereabouts, come down, visit, drop me a line, and I'll come out and say hello. Uh, I've had a bunch of awesome videos coming out with SciShow and SciShow Space. So go over to youtube.com slash SciShow to check all that stuff out. Fantastic. David, what are you working on? Um, freelance writing as usual for Universe Today and Sky and Telescope. And I am furiously working and editing maps, which is its own kind of editing hill for my future book. Uh, that is the companion book to the first book. That what a wonderful book that year. is. Yes. This next one is going to be entirely a field guide to the night sky, evergreen, deep sky objects black and white maps used out in the field. And like I said, I'm finding out that star map editing is its own personal kind of hell to do. It's really, uh, but they're going to look cool. I, I finally got them to a way to look kind of where I think they're going to be kind of neat. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited, but then I had a hand in thinking of the idea. So, uh, you know, we, we collaborated on the concept and then, uh, and then you volunteered to write it. So it's perfect but I'll be coming back around. Um, I got a chance to play around with the Stellina telescope. Have you seen this, You're David? You're telling me about it. I went yeah. and looked at that online. That is interesting. I'm curious how that actually I played with it last night, and it is the most astonishing thing. It is, it is this, and I'll, I'm going to have a review up in the next couple of days, but it is like this amazing capsule that you put out it doesn't you know, look like a telescope. It doesn't look like a field on a on a on a field, and yeah. then it the telescope kind of comes out of it, and then it figures out where it is, uses GPS, GPS, figures out what it's looking at based on the positions of the stars in the sky, and then you tell it what you want to look at, and it just starts taking astrophotos of these objects. There's no polar alignment. There's no star finding. There's nothing. It just so you don't even have to be outside. You just like toss it out the door. And yeah, then yeah. If you want, yeah, yeah. Like you remote, connect like to a it little through Wi-Fi. Station. And <laughs> there's and, no eyepiece. It's like, and there's it's no eyepiece. No, so it's, it's electronic images. It's dumping images directly onto your phone, and it is it's building them up over time. So you get one picture. Yeah every 10 seconds that's a little better than the previous picture that you had it is how much this thing costs about four thousand dollars yeah they're not cheap i looked at that too i'm yeah. like yeah I'll, I'll probably stick with what i have here for now. so i have a really complicated review of it but the shorter answer is it's the, one of the most amazing pieces of technology that i've ever seen in the field of astronomy and yet i'm not sure who needs it so well if they're popular they'll probably come down in price i mean like that's like the first dslrs or anything you know they're always they're i think always everyone's gonna everyone is gonna everyone should make these yeah and so that's it's a little refractor it's like an 80 millimeter refractor yeah. but it's folded up into a case so yeah yeah i had to go online and, and when you yeah. talked about it afterwards and, and look yeah. at it a little it, bit on the YouTube. craziest thing i've ever seen it's this vision yeah. of the future so anyway um moya what are you working on Research-wise, I'm trying to simulate the orbits of stars in the galactic bulge to kind of count how often they'll have these close encounters. Uh, that's taking a lot of time. But for outreach, I'm really excited. In a few weeks, I'm starting a regular appearance on a comedy show in New York where I get to give a short lecture. I get to try to give a short science lecture while comedians heckle me uh, from the audience. That's awesome. That where like can fun. people Signing find up out for abuse? Yeah, where can people find out more about uh, about what you're working on? Uh, I have a website where I list all of my upcoming live events. It's moyamcteer.com, uh, and on Twitter I post everything. Uh, maybe too much. Uh, I'm at I'm go astro mo on Twitter. Fantastic, Michael. What are you working on? I'm trying to get my thesis. I'm applying for jobs. So I'm finishing up my research. Uh, we got a HSC proposal in a, about two cycles ago where we're looking at star clusters, tidal tails, trying to get their ages and masses. So I'm trying to uh, kind of get that paper wrapped up, published, and 
in my CV for my future applications. And then uh, in about a week and a half, we're going to be doing astronomy on tap in State College, uh, very similar to what we're doing here, except in a bar, so you get to drink beer. And we're going to be talking about aliens, since it's around the time for the uh, Area 51 uh, raid. Oh, no. So we're advertising, <laughs> please don't go to Area 51, go to State College, and yeah. we can learn about aliens there in a much safer environment. Yeah, where nobody has, uh, <laughs> yeah, where nobody's mad about it at all. You can just come, yes. hang out, talk about aliens in a very friendly environment. That sounds good. Yes, yes. No good luck with yeah. everything. Good luck, yeah. Yeah, I hope everybody comes and hangs out with you and the, you know, 200, 2 million people hanging out <laughs> in the, on campus with you would be a lot better than everyone showing up at Area 51, which so. is a terrible idea. Um, awesome. Well, where, where can people find out more about what you're working on? Uh, so I do have a website uh, as well. I don't actually know the URL offhand. But if you do Google Michael Roderick, you can find my uh, Penn State website, and I've got my activities listed there. Uh, and it should also have a link to the um, State College Astronomy on Top site as well. Fantastic. All right. All right. Well, let's put everybody back on the screen here. There's all of us. Uh, so welcome back everybody to the new season of the weekly space hangout i hope you enjoy the changes that we make special guests uh a huge thank you to everyone watching uh all of the moderators of course the hard work by nancy graziano to organize to herd all the cats uh susie to do the production and of course all of this week's co-hosts an absolute pleasure and great to meet you guys it's so great to be here uh, many more good shows this year. <laughs> all right. Thanks, thanks everyone. We'll us. see you all next week. Bye. I got to remember which buttons to press. I don't even know how to do this anymore. All right. There Remembering we go. now an hour goes by really quick. I know.